It's no secret. Hello and welcome to Third Sector Insights, the knowledge and learning podcast from the National Lottery Community Fund. I'm Josh Coles Riley and I work for the fund in the knowledge and learning team. We've created Third Sector Insights to give a platform to organisations funded by the National Lottery Community Fund to share the knowledge and insight they've gained through their projects. Each episode you'll hear directly from third sector leaders, project staff, volunteers and the people and communities they support. We'll talk to them about their projects and the difference our funding makes and about key lessons, challenges, mistakes and successes. Basically, any learning that might be helpful to other groups and organisations seeking to make a difference in their communities. Each episode will focus on a different topic, an area of special interest or maybe a challenge or experience that lots of third sector organisations have in common. We don't want this podcast to be about us as a funder giving our position or saying this is the view of the National Lottery Community Fund. Instead, Third Sector Insight, and the clue is in the name, is about drawing out the wealth of insights, wisdom and experience third sector organisations are gaining through the projects we fund. So on this episode, we'll be focusing on something which is a thorny issue for lots of organisations, project sustainability. This is something many grant makers encourage or even require organisations to plan for when they're applying for funding. So how are you going to ensure the project activity is able to continue once the grant comes to an end? It's no secret too that this is something that lots of third sector organisations struggle with and have struggled with increasingly as the external operating environment has grown more challenging. Before we get going on this, I want to emphasise that there are no easy answers to this. Every organisation is different, so we'll need to be thinking about project sustainability in very specifically in relation to their own mission, context and resources, as well as the specific activity they're delivering. I also wanted to say that sustainability isn't necessarily good in and of itself, so while every project should have a plan for what happens at the end of the grant, that doesn't necessarily have to be a plan for keeping the project going long term. Having said all of that, with all those provisors out of the way, we wanted to talk today with a charity we think has a real vision for future sustainability, who've been thinking about sustainability in quite creative ways and really integrated it all the way throughout their project. So I'm here today at our Cardiff office with Renette Roberts, the director of Oasis Cardiff, to talk about their National Lottery funded project and how they plan to keep it going after our funding comes to an end. So hello, Renette. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much for coming down today. Um, To start us off, can you just tell our listeners a little bit about Oasis Cardiff? Yes, Oasis Cardiff is a centre for refugees and asylum seekers based in Splot. We've been running for 11 years on Monday and we provide services and activities that help refugees and asylum seekers feel they have a safe place to go and also integrate into the local community. Could you tell me a bit about how the organisation got started and how it got to where it is today? It's my fault it got started. (laughs) I started it. I um, was volunteering in different organisations and I couldn't see a place that brought refugees and asylum seekers out of where they were living to mix with the local community and to give them a safe place to tell their stories, to share experiences and just have a place to be. Mm. So we opened up, well, 11 years ago and it's just grown over that time to being in a small room to a whole big building which is f- literally filled to the to the roof <laughs> with different people and different activities and all the activities we've done have developed over out of what clients want um, not my ideas I always said we'd never do English classes and we do multiple English classes because I don't like teaching English but there you go <laughs> I think actually one of uh, one of our one of my colleagues mentioned that when Oasis started, there were about four of you, or maybe even smaller, and now you've, you've expanded yes, quite yes. a lot. Yes, we were all volunteers at the beginning, and then slowly we got funding over the years, and it's just grown. I think there are quite a lot of staff now. I keep losing track of how many, but we have more than ten, so it's pretty amazing. Right, yeah. Really. yeah. So now that you're operating on this much larger scale, how do you keep that going? Or is there, are there challenges associated with that? The challenges are getting funding and remembering to get funding that is for the the right project that you want to do, not looking for funding and then trying to fit a project in it that I don't think is the right way to be. And to keep focused on your aims and objectives, I think that's really important because it's very easy and I'm very good at going off on a sidetrack. So we try and keep things focused on what our goals are. Um, but it is hard and we don't have government funding so we're really grateful to people like yourselves and other funders that fund us and people that donate as well so I think it's really important. 
something that my colleague mentioned was that uh, you had support from the Lloyds Foundation yes. um, with a grant around capacity building. Would you tell us a bit about that as well? Yes, we've had it twice, a third time now. And um, in fact, it started paying my salary. So it's been amazing. And they also have add-on support. So we've had developmental support, consultants come in. We've lit- we've just had um, Lloyds Bank have come and developed a process for us. So when we have ideas for projects from clients, volunteers and staff, we're going to have twice a year a focus week where we get ideas from people and then we go through a process to see whether they would work, what whether they fit with our aims and objectives and where we would get the funding from or if we need funding for them. So it's a, that's a really exciting support that we've had and a a really exciting plan to make sure that we get ideas from the people that we serve rather than just think of ideas that we want because there may be some amazing ideas out there that we haven't thought of yeah yeah and that really chimes with the values of the national lottery community fund and our kind of people in the lead approach as well so um your your project that we fund is called the plate project is that right yes do you want to tell us a little bit about that The plate project was a long time coming. (laughs) I was talking about a food project for a long time because food is very central to people's existence. We need it to survive, but it also brings people together. It brings communities together, whether it's to argue about the origins of falafel, where they come from and where hummus comes from, because each different country claims it for their own and are quite territorial about it. But it also help give some people a tool to talk about the issues, to chat to each other, to get to know each other without feeling awkward and threatened. So we had talked about doing a food project that trained people in hospitality and catering to get them into employment and also to serve our clients because we feed about 140 a day. So that's what the plate project was. Um, an added bonus was we bought a food trailer with some funding from another um, funder and we've used that as a tool to go out to different places um, and also in our car park to sell refugee focused food to raise awareness about refugee and asylum seeking issues without shoving it down people's throats and making them feel threatened. You've talked a little bit about how the idea for the project came about. Um, How did you kind of come up with the project plan? And we went for a project plan because we felt that that would help us focus on the five years of the project so we could see how it was going to develop with the timeline and and everything. Um, We thought about what our aims and objectives were going to be, what we wanted to see at the end of the project, because for us it will continue, but we need it to be sustainable. So that was a really important part for me. I think you're about six months in, is that right? Okay. Yes. Um, How would you describe the journey of the project so far? It's been really interesting because it's meant that we could employ staff to to run the project, which has made life a lot easier. We always ran the kitchen with volunteers before, so that has given some continuity. We've been able to train um, clients in food and hygiene certificates and have volunteers in the kitchen. We've also had um, volunteers that work on the food trailer and we've also been able to employ refugees to work on the food trailer as well so we've been able to give I think four clients um, employability and we've taken it out to different places and developed partnerships so for example we work with Cowbridge Food Festival so we went there this year and next year we're going to do a bigger project with them where we're looking for funding joint funding together and it We've been working with Green Man Festival um, and Green Man Trust supports us. So we took the food trailer along this year and we actually sold food, which was amazing. And our clients loved it. And then they're off to Cheltenham Food, Cheltenham Literary Festival for 10 days. So there's lots of different ways, but also a way that I didn't think of using it was to open it out in the car park once a month. So we've opened up... um, the food trailer in the summer months we're not going to do it in the winter because it's a bit too cold and wet and we sold food and a lot of the local community have come along people have just walked past and played we've got a music group a drumming group and they perform so it just draws people in and it's meant the local communities see it as 
not just for refugees and asylum seekers but for them as well and it's given them a bit of ownership and also with the supper clubs that we'd actually started before but we've developed more uh, sold out so that's a really exciting way of sharing different cult cultures food and sharing a bit about the country that people come from and sharing food together great great um so i i know um you you haven't been going an awfully long time but i wonder if you could talk a bit about the difference that you see the project making so far already it has given confidence to clients some people didn't know how to cook and they've learnt how to cook and, and work and then volunteer in the kitchen and their levels of English have improved because they've had to use their English and it's given them a pride for their food from their country and it's been really lovely to see confidence growing people that um, are quite quiet have been able to shout out orders um, and feel competent in the food trailer and in the supper club so that has been lovely to see and to see people going into employment as well has been a really positive effect on it and also being able to feed people on a daily basis good hot food every day has been a real bonus and we use fair share and donations from supermarkets so that's and um, Nando's give us chicken and um, pret manger has helped us as well so there's been lots of different ways of using food that wouldn't normally get used as well. Oh, brilliant. And so when you say um, being able to feed people every day, you're referring to feeding refugees and asylum seekers? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah. Which is distinct from... From the outside community. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, has anything surprised you in the delivery of the project so far? Well, when we bought the food trailer, <laughs> we didn't realise we'd need to have vehicles to pull it. So that's been quite interesting. Um, we've had a few sort of hiccups with that and also realising that our kitchen because we're feeding so many we need to improve it so we hadn't thought that through but we're hoping to change our kitchen and make it more of a commercial kitchen okay. um, but I think seeing how people will suddenly become interested in something and I think that has surprised me about how passionate people are about their food and also how similar some foods are as well and how how many people are you feeding every every day? Um, when we last counted, it was 143 oh, wow. for lunch, but for a short time we're going to be doing some more catering, so it's going to be a bit busier. Wow, okay. What are your plans or your vision for the project over the next, is it four or five years? It's five years. Five, We've five got over the next five years, yeah. I think we would like to continue using the food trailer, the supper clubs, develop those more do more pop-up um, restaurant events. I think we have one pound for this autumn. And do more festivals as well, but be more organised in our, where we're going with festivals. And just develop training, better training for our clients, as well as cookery classes for our community, the refugee community, because some of the men don't know how to cook, because traditionally the women have done all the cooking. And so that they can make themselves meals that are healthy and well balanced without costing a lot of money because they don't get much support monetary support when they're asylum seekers and also using it as a tool to reach the wider community so that we can build break down barriers build bridges and get the local community into the building as well so that they don't see it as an alien place so uh, one of the features of the grant that I was quite interested in is that um, your project planners have been designed so that you get less and less funding from us each of the, each year. Can you tell us about why you um, designed the project in that way? Um, we were being creative with how to use the money. <laughs> <laughs> so we knew that when we started we would need more start-up costs, so we would need to buy some equipment, um, pay salaries, but we also recognised that as we develop more, and we can do more outside catering, do more events. We hope to generate income that will help us to make the project sustainable after the project ends. So the plate will continue regardless of whether we are funded or not. That would be the ideal, but it'll take a lot of hard work and a lot of diversifying. So we also sp sell spice packs and coffee and tea packs. So it's trying to think a bit outside of the box as well. Okay, cool. So I think this is a slightly related point, is that 
another slightly unusual feature of the project is you're employing a, a food consultant, is that right? Yes, yes. We recognised that we didn't have the expertise. We might have the ideas, but we needed some extra support for portion control, where the best place to get your orders are, um, how to s- serve the food, different ideas about how to adapt some recipes so that they're manageable because some of the food will take a long time to prepare. So it's been a really positive and learning experience. It's been great. Well, I've actually, I was at Green Man, so I, I went to the food truck at Green Man. Oh, and okay. I can uh, testify that the food is really, really good. And it's a very professional operation. Yes, it has been. I mean, I still, I've made enough um Albanian spinach and feta pies to f- from when we first used it at the Festival of Voice down at WMC but I still eat it even at Green Man I was having for my supper I was having <laughs> feta pie because oh, I like it so delicious. much yeah. it is really nice so it was something that I would have never thought about eating but I love it so yes so um that, that actually it, that's something that um quite a lot of grant holders are doing um is some kind of catering element to try and generate income for their organisations, um, whether that's a community centre or a project like yours. What advice would you give those other organisations? I would say if they're thinking of applying, I always think it's good to speak to someone that works for fun because they can tell you whether it's totally off the scale or feasible because it's very easy to have amazing ideas but sometimes you need to be reined in a little and I think also to not feel frightened to do it I think if you think too much about what you want to achieve you might not even go for it and try and it's better to try than not bother at all and I think yeah you should just go out and do it that was really nice encouraging advice, but I actually meant um, specifically <laughs> in relation to um, using catering. No, I think go for it. I think food is really important. I think as a country, we and well, as for Cardiff, we're quite a diverse um, city, and I think we have a lot of traditions that we could lose with food, and I think it's really important to keep those alive and have a lot of diversity, give people choice, and I think good food is really important yeah we'll definitely agree with that so if we come on to sort of the, the, the we, we've touched on this a little bit already um but as i said at the beginning the, the the episode is about project sustainability and it would be great if you could share some of your plans for keeping the plate project going after five years when our grant funding comes to an end i i get um reined in <laughs> with my ideas my my dream would be to have a good quality restaurant that is serving refugee food that people come and learn about where we can have clients serving and cooking and cleaning and being part of the the whole setup and hopefully managed by them as well but it would also generate income for Oasis I'm aware that a lot of you need a lot of income to run our organisation, but every little helps. So I think I sort of look at the clink and think how that's run, and it would be really nice to do that and to feel that people are being trained because hospitality is very short of um, good quality staff. Though That's what I've read in the papers and things, and I think it's an opportunity that I don't want to miss out on, and I think there's some amazing food that people have brought as their culture and heritage and it'd be really nice to share it with the wider public. Well, that's really exciting as an ambition. Do you mind just explaining what the clink is to anyone who's listening who doesn't know? So the clink is a res- there's a chain of restaurants and they're run and catered by um, inmates, prison inmates. So they, they're, I think they're often in open prisons, but they have a very good reputation for very high quality food. And that's what I would like to aspire to to be like yeah yeah okay are there are there elements of the existing plate project that you you think um that you've got plans for for keeping sustainable outside this restaurant ambition yeah the food trailer Mm -hmm. i think the food trailer has been a really positive um 
influence and part of the play project. It wasn't a, what we originally thought of, but it just goes to show, yeah, you get different ideas when you bounce ideas off each other. So it's it's something that we would definitely keep going. And I think catering for events, for people for events as well, Brilliant. is something that we will do. Yeah, yeah. How did the um, idea for the food trailer come about then? <laughs> we... We hadn't been out for it, ever been out for a staff Christmas meal before and we went out to one and we were given hummus and it was awful. And we sat there and we said we could do better than that. And so we started sending eBay food trailer pictures to each other. There's, there was two of us over Christmas and then we applied for to get some money and someone through um, Festival Voice told us about the food trailer that we have that was for sale and we bought it. And it's amazing. That was a great find. It was an amazing find, yes. It was in Brighton. I'm not able to say where we got it from, but they gave it to us at a very good price. Oh, fab. And it was amazing. Fab, fab. So um, I suppose going beyond Oasis now and thinking about project sustainability more broadly, what do you think are the main things organisations need to think about in their plans for sustaining their project if they've got a funded project? I think you need to look at who your client group is, what skills they have, and whether it's something that's marketable, that the general public will want to buy or want to utilise because you could have some great ideas but there may not be the desire to purchase anything like that. And I think you need to be realistic. Um, you have to provide a high quality service or product. So I think it's start small and then grow bigger take your time because it's very easy to think oh I have a factory and I will hand make wooden items or upcycle but you need to start with what you've got and then build up build it up slowly so maybe if you're applying for funding you develop it over the five years what I mean this is a slightly similar question but what what advice would you give another organization who has funding from us about how to keep their project going after our funding comes to an end um, I would think if you were going for more funding from somewhere else, I would start planning to apply for funding early because it it takes time. I think as well, keep a record of what profit you make if you're doing a sustainable project so that you can see how you can balance the books. But start planning it, I would say, two years into the project if you've got a five-year project because you need to look at your cash flow projections and taper it down if you don't have too much be realistic but also be optimistic i like that i like the rhyme there as well <laughs> and um thank you very much for coming here today to talk about the plate project and keep up the good work thank you and you're welcome <laughs> you've been listening to third sector insights the knowledge and learning podcast from the national lottery community fund the project you heard about in this episode is one of 11,000 funded every year across the UK with money raised by National Lottery players. To find out more about Oasis Cardiff, you can visit their website at www.oasiscardiff.org. If you're interested in learning more about financial sustainability in the third sector, you'll be pleased to know we recently commissioned some research about third sector resilience. You can access the report, including a directory of services available to support third sector organisations in Wales, via our blog, www bigblogwales.org.uk. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. Please let us know by leaving us a review or you can email me your thoughts directly at joshuacoles riley at tnlcommunityfund.org.uk. Thanks for listening to Third Sector Insights. Keep a lookout for future episodes where we'll continue to talk with third sector organisations and find out what knowledge, learning and insights they're gaining through projects funded by the National Lottery.